Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to, uh, to, uh, to the Data Science Learning Path uh, event. So my name is Shawa. Uh, I will be the speaker for tonight, uh, and I'll be introducing Data Science Learning Path, and I'll talk about uh, por portfolio project building. Um, let's try to make this a very interactive session. Um, so I'm going to talk about the learning path, um, but I'm pretty sure you've done your research, or some of you may have learned, uh, have you know, started learning data science already. Um, so let's try to build a curriculum together. Um, I welcome your input. I'm gonna provide my uh, my feedback uh, as well. And uh, I would like to spend a little bit of time on discussing how to get started with portfolio project building. Um, as you must know, right now the job market is pretty tough uh, with all the big tech companies uh, laying off people, cutting tens of thousands of jobs. Um, I, I believe this is temporary, right? Uh, the market will need to, need to absorb a lot of these talents, um, but um, when things get better, the companies will start to hire again. Uh, the demand for data scientists, for data professionals in general, is definitely going to uh, keep growing. Uh, so we just need to get prepared. Um, but because it's very competitive and there's so many training boot camps out there and we Cloud Data is one of those academies, but you also have college programs, university programs, master's degree in data science. There will be a lot, a ton of online training courses as well. So how do we stand out in the job market? Um, and everyone knows that they need to build some sort of you know pro project so that it can showcase uh, the skill sets to uh, to hiring companies. Um, but how do we go about it? So hopefully I can give you some insight tonight, and uh, and at the end I'll leave some questions for uh, uh, some time for for Q and A's. Okay. Uh, if you would like to uh, stay in touch, uh, this is my email address, uh, and then you can connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Um, before we get started, I would like to share some resources with everyone. We do have a Discord channel. Um, we're actually trying to grow our Discord community um, because we share a lot of uh, the workshop recordings, learning resources on our Discord. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'm going to send you the link. Uh, so if you are not in uh, uh, in Discord, uh, feel free to join us, uh, and then you'll receive recordings of past events as well. Uh, usually, you get some sort of automate, uh, automated, you know, notification. Uh, and recently, we also launched uh, We Cloud Open. Uh, so this is a learning portal uh, where our bootcamp students, uh, you know, use on a daily basis for for learning. Um, but we also sort of make you know part of this learning portal. Uh, an open platform where uh, anyone can join uh, this platform and start learning some, uh, you know, some uh, fundamental skills such as SQL and Python. Uh, so we open sourced our SQL and Python courses, um, and we're going to add data science machine learning uh, later this year as well. Uh, we also have uh, workshop recordings and some, you know, open courses on uh, DevOps, data engineering, uh, machine learning engineering as well. So if you're interested in uh, having access to some great learning resources, uh, feel free to join We Cloud Open. And we are also running some live classes this week. Uh, so we did a SQL session on Tuesday and tomorrow Friday evening, uh, we'll kick off uh, the Python live classes. Uh, so we're going to run that for three weeks. So there will be three sessions, basically going through some of the exercises uh, in our open Python and SQL courses. Uh, if you're interested, uh, feel free to join. You can go to wecloudata.com slash wecloudopen, or maybe just join the Discord community, and then you'll always have notifications of those meetings and uh, events. Um, you can join. Uh, you can follow us on YouTube as well, because that's where uh, we upload most of our event recordings and open courses as well. Um, and tonight, we're going to talk about data science learning path. That's part of the career guide. Um, so if you would like to read our career guide in detail, um, here's the link. So yeah, let me let me share a, a link with everyone uh, so you have access to them. And, uh, and I'll start to talk about the learning path, okay? All right, and uh, my LinkedIn and email here as well. Okay, let's get started. Um, I would like to talk about the career guide and learning path first. Um, I think uh, two weeks ago, uh, we introduced the data science um, career guide. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, you know, getting started with data science, I, I think I just recommend you to read the 
you know, the, the career guide. Um, and you can go to wecloudatacom uh, slash career guides. Or when you come to the website, you can just go to uh, resources and then you will be able to find We Cloud Open, uh, the link for the open courses, and then you'll be able to find the career guide as well. Uh, today, since uh, we're only talking about the learning path, so I have this page open right now. Uh, I'm just gonna walk you through uh, this uh, this article, and then uh, I'd like to spend some time on uh, on Notion. Uh, let's do some brainstorming and uh, let's discuss, You know, maybe we can curate a learning path together, okay? Uh, this is a, a recording uh, of an event that I did in the past. So if you're interested in knowing what is data science, you know, what does data scientists do, you can watch this recording as well. Um, in general, in terms of the data science skills, uh, you need to you need to sort of uh, know. Um, you definitely need to know Python, uh, SQL, and uh, that these are the two fundamental skill set a data scientist need to have. Um, this data is collected from Indeed. And some of them are from, uh, from I think, uh, LinkedIn. And uh, if you just do, uh, you know, a, a word count, right? Uh, I think we scraped a couple of hundred or maybe thousands of uh, data scientists uh, job postings. Um, and in this case, it's probably a couple of hundred. Uh, and then we just did a word count, right? And then Python is mentioned most frequently, followed by R, uh, and then SQL. That tells you that, you know, uh, coding is very important for data scientists. Um, but data scientists are not software engineers. They're not developers, right? So they, they use Python and SQL to do data analysis. So when you learn Python and SQL, uh, you don't have to train yourself to become a SQL developer or Python developer. It would be great if you have very advanced coding skills. Um, but at the very beginning of your journey, I think you need to learn enough Python and SQL so that you can start to work on projects. I couldn't emphasize this enough. There are 10 different ways of becoming a data scientist, right? And uh, people have different opinions, but I'm more speaking, uh, you know, about this from, uh, from a beginner's per perspective, uh, because the amount of stuff you need to learn can be very overwhelming. Uh, you need to learn Python and then SQL, you need to know a little bit, you know, statistics, right? And then you need to move on to um, some linear algebra uh, and then machine learning. When you start to learn machine learning, there are a bunch of algorithms you need to learn, uh, and the whole, whole like you know end to end pipeline you need to learn how to build ML pipelines, um, and then you need to learn cloud, big data as well, right? It's not a um, must have, but knowing big data is always going to give you an advantage if you would like to work in data science. Uh, then it turns out that there are so many things you need to learn. Sometimes three months, six months is not even enough time unless you join a very immersive, you know, boot camp, right? Um, so, and then you, you always need to keep going, right? You need the momentum. You need to build the momentum, obviously. So spending too much time on just learning statistics, coding uh, is not going to be very effective. You can always come back and improve your coding skills. Um, but at the very beginning of your journey, uh, try to learn enough Python SQL and you have to actually work on hands-on projects because through the hands-on projects, you'll notice your weakness. You'll know there are a lot of things that you will need to learn, um, but it keeps you motivated because you, you get to build stuff and then you get to see the, the output, right? That's very important. And you sort of to get into the habit of, you know, just building things. That's very important for data scientists, okay? Because ultimately learning these coding tools is, you know, tools are just tools. You learn these tools to work on data analytics. Um, we all know that ChatGPT is becoming very popular now, and uh, it can even write code for you. But it doesn't really replace data scientists. At least, you know, I, I don't see that happening in the in the next couple of years. Um, because the way I think about data scientists is that writing code is is just part of you know the job. But um, data scientists should actually be very specialized in analyzing data. I can tell you, I've worked with or I've hired um, a lot of software engineers and data scientists and data engineers in the past. Um, some of them are really good at coding, uh, but not everyone's really good at analyzing data, to be honest. And sometimes when I work with data analysts um, or analytics professional and even executives, I notice that they have much better intuition about data and analytics problems. 
And uh, there's, you know, I, I think in the job market, we have a lot of um, data scientists to be, right, Who who's really good at coding. But when, it, when you give them a data analytics project or a problem, they actually don't know how to go about it. Or sometimes when, you, when, when two persons are looking at the same chart, they just end up having different kind of conclusions. That's very interesting. And I, I, I was very surprised uh, when I was working for, you know, big companies in the past and those directors and VPs, they're super good at numbers. And, uh, and some, sometimes like when they, um, you know, when the way they interpret uh, some of the plots and charts, um, and I learned a ton, yeah, because they, they, they don't do the hands-on coding, um, but because they understand the business and some of the key metrics so well, um, and it's very easy for them to get something, but uh, for sometimes for the data scientists, because they're very used to just writing the code and they spend like, you know, 70, 60% of the time writing the code, producing those plots, but they don't think about those problems and the business, be, uh, you know, challenges behind these, you know, these plots. So again, I, I think that's why that's, that's the part where chat, chat GPT cannot automate, you know, for many, many years, you know, in the future, because I think uh, you still need human who can actually interpret the business and every business is different. They can use the same databases. They can use the same Python or whatever AWS platform. Um, and uh, it could be the same, you know, same industry, two different banks, but they will implement things in very different ways. Um, and that's why we always need someone who can specialize in, uh, in communication and also analytics in general. Um, being able to do machine learning doesn't mean you're really good at analytics. Uh, I think analytics is always related to the business. Um, so just keep this in mind. Uh, and that's why I encourage everyone to, um, to sort of start working on, you know, portfolio project, even just small exercises. Um, and don't spend too much time on statistics at the beginning of your data science learning journey. But again, on, on the flip side, there are also people who have seen successes, you know, uh, when it comes to to you know a different way of learning data science where they uh, they can you know they can grind through you know three months of Python programming uh, and even learning web development and then they come back to statistics you know they spend two months on math and then they move on to machine learning so they can go through the whole process you know for about 12 months and they're super self-disciplined right and if you're that kind of learner that's great for you uh, I think you'll be very successful but we have worked with so many students and we can tell that uh, most people will work better or learn faster when they actually work on like building stuff, just working on projects, right? And through hands-on projects, you realize that, you know, it's actually an interesting. And sometimes students, when they work on the project, they realize that they're actually not excited about data science at all, but they heard about data science. They want to do it. They join a boot camp, but it turns out that they're, it's not the right program for them. So I always recommend you, uh, take a free Python course or Udemy course and just learn a little bit about data analytics in general. And you have to think about if this is a career that you're actually interested in. I don't want, I'm not trying to discourage you, but uh, you absolutely want to work on something that's not only well paid, um, you know, but it also needs to be a fun job for you, right? Okay, so uh, I think I spent too much time on this, but uh, I think the main point here is that uh, it's important to start working on the project as soon as possible. You can always come back and improve. Um, so I think this is an iterative process, right? Uh, it's not very linear. You, you, you work on Python and then you start to pick up, you know, a small project and then you come back and they improve your Python skills, right? And you can start to work on more. And then, you know, over time, you realize that you can actually take on more uh, sophisticated projects. Here's the learning path in general, but I, I'd rather just like, you know, um, open my Notion page and we go through that together. Okay, so let's switch to Notion and I'll come back to this. Um, you must have done some, some research. I'd like to uh, get your input in, on this as well. What do you think a data scientist will need to learn? Let's try to build a curriculum together. Um, I think first I will need to enable you to, uh, to be able to unmute yourself. So feel free to speak up or uh, send your comments to uh, to Zoom chat. Okay, so uh, Anura said um, statistics. Yeah. What else? Visualization. Okay. SQL, uh, Python, SQL syntax, data wrangling. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, pandas, yes, these are uh, tools. Okay. Uh, yeah, data wrangling, data cleaning. Uh, web scraping, I like that. Um, and a lot of people have this kind of question. So why should I be learning web scraping? It's not data analysis. Um, and I'll explain that. I think web scraping should always be one of the projects you work on because uh, that that's something related to data collection. And uh, it's going to make your project very unique. Uh, if you can, I highly recommend uh, learners, you know, collecting your own data. Okay. Anything else a data scientist will need to learn? Presentation. Yes. Uh, how to structure. So let's say presentation skills. Entails? Absolutely, machine learning. So let's say soft skills, presentation, I see public speaking. Um, and then, okay, R, uh, I, I see machine learning, uh, data mining as well. Uh, business, SK Learn. Okay, it's hard for me to keep up now. Uh, SK Learn, uh, business, yes. Um, um, maybe I'll just put that under uh, soft skills. Uh, programming, okay. OOP, object oriented programming. I think we have a decent curriculum now. And NumPy, I would put that under uh, data wrangling. And of course, if you're new to data science, I'll explain all of these for you, okay? NLP, so that's part of machine learning. TensorFlow, which is the tool, okay. TensorFlow, awesome. Jupyter Notebook, um, okay. Text mining, NLP, yeah, these are all related. Data pipeline, ETL, that's interesting too. Um, I'll put it here. So maybe we'll do data engineering. So data pipelines, ETL, storytelling for sure. Uh, storytelling uh, in, you know, I'll, I'll move visualization here. It's not, well, it's technical skills, but uh, I'll just, let's say we group that under uh, business, uh, soft skills and communications. Uh, A-B testing, thank you. That's related to statistics. And when we talk about SQL, we need uh, relational databases, okay? EDA, that's short for exploratory data analysis. Uh, I'll put that in either statistics or machine learning, but kind of similar. So EDA, exploratory data analysis, Thanks guys, uh, and NoSQL, let's put that under data engineering. Hooray, uh, that's a pretty decent list. Now we have a curriculum. Uh, now I'll, I'll share this with you, don't worry, um, but I'm gonna uh, add some, uh, some more stuff. Um, well, this is very interesting. Uh, first of all, I agree. Uh, I think uh, you need to start from SQL. Um, I recommend SQL over Python. So in We Cloud Data's bootcamp, we actually start teaching SQL first um, because I think uh, if it, of course, it depends. I mean, if you, maybe if you come from like a computer science background, then uh, you already know SQL um, in Python. Um, but uh, a lot of the, the career switchers, uh, they come from business background, for example. So I, I think, you know, every, most of the people will know how to work with Excel uh, and to, to work with structured data. So going from Excel to SQL, I, I feel like it's a lot easier. You know, things like VLOOKUP, it's just like the join, right, in, uh, in SQL. So uh, I think starting with SQL is, uh, is not a bad idea, uh, something that I, I would recommend. When you learn SQL, um, and first of all, it's structured, right, query language. That's what we're going to teach next Tuesday in the live class. So if you're interested, join the Week Cloud Open uh, SQL class. And um, we'll begin with the databases. You do need to understand how databases work uh, at, a, at a high level, right? Uh, data scientists are not going to be installing, you know, databases and 
optimizing database you know performances those belong to like database administrators uh, or could be a data engineer's job sometimes um, i think data scientists need to be really good at writing sql queries right querying data that means uh, you know uh, selecting data right selection filters or filtering data right um, emerging data right uh, in sql that's basically join and you need to be able to do aggregation and you can translate this into sql like selection and filtering in sql you can create filters right join that's some sort of vlookup right aggregation that's like pivot table basically right group by um and that's the analytics part like you, you need to be able to absolutely manipulate know how to manipulate and query data uh so they can do data analysis and answer business questions um and i think uh to become a data scientist you also need to know how to uh sort of optimize uh query performance and uh, be able to write complex right queries okay querying data is like it's the basic stuff everyone needs to know uh, in some companies or in some, you know, sometimes data scientists wanted to uh, prepare data for machine learning, right? Data may actually come from 10 different sources. Uh, you might be writing queries that, you know, that are two, 300 lines of code, and it's joining 10, 15 tables, right? And uh, it's very complex query. Um, and, uh, well, it's actually better to sort of break it down, right? And, um, but sometimes the employers will be able to tell how experienced you are with SQL um, by just looking at, uh, you know, the SQL queries you've run, uh, you've written. And sometimes they will give you, uh, I've seen interview questions, data scientists interview questions, like the employer give you um, a SQL script and it's pretty long script and uh, they don't give you the data. They just ask you to basically um, to read the SQL script and, uh, and, and tell them like how you would like to optimize that query. That's very interesting. You absolutely need to have some sort of experience working with complex queries uh, to be able to sort of optimize that, right? So uh, that's SQL. Um, another area of, uh, of SQL is that, you know, SQL is this just query querying tool. Uh, we're going to do data, data extraction, right? Uh, so where where does the data go like after we run the sql queries right because obviously sql is not the platform for us to do data science like we're gonna not gonna do machine learning in sql right well actually some platforms like snowflake they're working on some capabilities that allows data scientists to do machine learning in in, in a relational database but that's a separate topic uh, most of the time Data scientists will be writing some SQL queries because the data is pretty big, right? You're not able to host all of these data on your laptop. So it needs to be stored in a powerful database and you write queries to extract data. And then you, you put the data into your data science platform. It could be Amazon SageMaker. It could be your Python environment, right? In the Jupyter Notebook, okay? So you're still going to get the data into a Python environment, and then you start using Python to do data analysis, okay? But if you're doing visualization, because I'm gonna mention visualization, right? So if you do data visualization, and most of, most of the time, like Tableau, Power BI, you connect that to a SQL database, right? And there, there's like stored procedures or queries that you run uh, to refresh you know, the, the visualization dashboard. Okay, so uh, so that's why you also need to understand a little bit about data modeling or you know entity relationship by right? diagrams, ER diagrams, uh, dimensional modelings, uh, which uh, is related to BI, business intelligence or data engineering as well. So knowing that will be helpful. Okay, um, yeah. So that's SQL, uh, and then let's move on to Python. Uh, what are some of the things you think we, sh we should be learning when it comes to Python for data science? Let's say Python for data science, right? And of course, we need to start with the, the fundamentals, right? Uh, Python programming basics, which means you need to understand how to do coding, right? So the basic data types of Python, right? How to work with loops, okay? Um, and how to write functions, 
but these are the fundamentals. Right? It has nothing to do with data science. If you want to learn Python, you want to work with Python, you have to know these basics. And that's why like on Udemy, I think there's a very famous Python course called, I think Python programming from zero to hero or something like that. It's a very good course. Uh, it has a little bit of data science in it. Like I think they start to teach pandas, um, but it's just a, a Python programming course, right? Um, that's the foundation you need to have before you start to use Python to do data analysis, okay? Yep, data structures. Uh, so that's part of data types. Um, so list, right? Uh, tuples, set, dictionaries, right? Uh, how to work with loops, functions. Uh, someone mentioned object-oriented programming, okay? Yep, conditionals. Um, statistics libraries, then I would put that uh, uh, under statistics. Uh, but yeah, we're going to use R or Python for statistics. Uh, same for R, you have to pick up like the R syntax, right? Um, but in this case, uh, I would recommend just getting started with Python. Uh, I think Python is definitely in more demand in the industry. Um, and uh, it will be great if you know both Python and R, uh, but if you're just getting started or if your focus is on job search, I would recommend just focusing on Python uh, because if you time is always a constraint. Getting good at both is going to take time and patience as well. So I'd rather just get really good at Python, uh, is, you know, uh, than you know becoming you know mediocre, you know, with with both. So in that case, just focus on Python, get really good at it, and then you can already to do big data, machine learning, a lot of things. Uh, you can always come back and learn more about R. Um, some of the students we worked with, they already learned R in, uh, in college and universities, uh, which is actually really, uh, really helpful. Uh, there's a question from, uh, from Joby. Uh, what about data analysis? Um, you notice that a, a big part of data science is actually data analytics. Um, I'm, I'm predicting that in the near future, data analytics and data science, they may merge. That's because data science is getting more specialized. Uh, if you want to focus on the machine learning side of data science, then in the future, you might become a machine learning scientist or machine learning engineer. And if you're only using Python, pandas, right, and statistics, for doing data analytics, then it's data analytics, you know, so you're a basic data analyst. So I think in the future, when tools become more automated and more powerful, and maybe we can even give ChatGPT the prompt, then uh, you, you don't have to write a lot of code anymore. This part can be automated. It saves you time, make you more efficient, uh, but you still need to be that brain that's analyzing the data. Um, unless one day all the banks Telecom e-commerce companies are willing to feed their data into ChatGPT, but there will all be all kinds of problems. For example, Facebook already banned internal usage of ChatGPT because data is always a company's advantage. No one is willing to allow their employees to give their, like for example, if you have a CSV file of all of your customers' behavior data, are you gonna allow your, you know, uh, it, you know, data scientists to upload that CSV file to ChatGPT server. And so ChatGPT can generate some visualization plot for you. Uh, I think most companies will not want to do that. Right? So it's going to be challenging. But if you can feed that kind of data into ChatGPT, maybe one day ChatGPT can be actually really powerful. But at this point, if you tell ChatGPT, hey, this is a structured table, a pandas data frame, can you, and I have column one to column 10, can you generate a bunch of pie chart, time series plots? That's something ChatGPT is really good at because it's just something like you can you can Google and Stack Overflow, you'll get a ton of you know template code, right? But that's not the value, real value of a data scientist, because the real value of a data scientist is after we generate these plots, we're gonna look at these and we're gonna discover trends and problems in the data. And every company's data problem is different. 
So that that's why I think data scientists still have a lot of value, right? And if ChatGPT like tools can help you sort of automate coding, that's great. It's going to save you a lot of repetitive work because any kind of job you work on for more than six months, things will start to become a little bit redundant, like you know, repetitive, right? Even for data science. So um, that's why I'm not worried about losing my job uh, as a trainer because I, I think a company will always need data scientists. Uh, who can actually do analytics but um but yeah back to the question i think uh if you're doing data science you're already doing data analytics you know data analysts will need to know some statistics as well need to understand uh, ab testing as well it's not really just like only data scientists need to know that right but of course data scientists will need to know more about algorithms machine learning you know natural language processing that's usually not the responsibility of a data analyst but i think data analysts will need to be very comfortable with basic statistics and data analytics, which includes writing queries, manipulating data, doing visualization, and do storytelling. That's like, so data analytics is actually part of data science, okay? Um, and uh, as they mentioned, uh, yeah, libraries, NumPy, pandas. So uh, statistics, linear algebra, um, so of course, tools and packages. Um, so NumPy, that's for numeric computing, um, but these are Python packages, right? Um, and it can use matplotlib, uh, matplotlib for uh, visualization, right? Um, and uh, yeah, Seaborn, these are basically uh, visualization libraries in the Python ecosystem. I put them here because we use that to observe trends in the data. So that's part of the statistical analysis because you always need to visualize data, understand the correlations, right? Understand the distributions. Uh, and that's why I put that under statistics, okay? Uh, there are also some scientific computing li libraries such as SciPy, right? If you want to do A-B testing, uh, you want to plot some sort of normal distribution, you're going to work with SciPy. So let me put that under, uh, yeah, that's under statistics, right? Uh, and linear algebra. And A-B AB testing is a very specific use case of statistics, right? Um, if you would like to do some sort of marketing campaign, right? Or maybe you go to Facebook, right? And sometimes they would like to click, like you to click on add. There's a button, right? So what should be the best color of that button or what should be the best text? Do we say, you know, uh, click to view packages, or are you going to use some other words, right? Um, traditionally, businesses will do, you know, make a decision based on their, you know, experience. Um, but if you would like to become a data-driven company, you have to do some sort of testing. You try both options, right? And statistically, would like to tell which one works better. Uh, so this is where actually, uh, statistics becomes very useful, okay? Uh, so A-B testing is something you definitely need to learn as a data analyst, especially the product analytics folks, like product managers and people who work on product analytics, you need to absolutely nail A-B testing. Uh, and data scientists in general will need to understand A-B testing as well. It's part of statistics, okay? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, no problem. If you have a bad internet connection, just so you know, uh, the recording will be, I think, automatically uploaded to uh, uh, to the Discord channel. Yeah. So when we whenever we upload something, uh, it will have a notification here. Okay. It will be on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Um, statistics, linear algebra, calculus. Uh, I think calculus, you just know, need to know the very, very basic. Uh, you're never going to get asked to write some kind of formula. Uh, it, it's mainly just helping you understand how machine learning, for example, um, partial derivatives, right? How, how, how does that work? But that sort of helps you understand how gradient descent optimizer work, uh, which is very important in machine learning and neural networks. So, uh, I, I, yeah, so just a very, I think even Khan Academy material, like, you know, if you just watch one or two videos, you understand the basics. So I wouldn't spend too much time on calculus. 
Um, but linear algebra, working with you know arrays and matrices, uh, these will be uh, very important. Um, but uh, and I think I would say statistics is probably more like if you want to nail in interviews, statistic questions are asked more frequently. So it's probably more important than the linear algebra because um, you will still need to understand distributions, right? How to out handle outliers, extreme values, uh, looking at normal distributions for feature engineering, um, A-B testing, hypothesis testing. These are all related to statistics. So, uh, but linear algebra, uh, because we have NumPy library, it's already very powerful. You're not going to write your own like matrix, you know, factorization algorithm. You're really just calling some packages to do that, right? Um, so, yeah, I'd focus more on statistics, um, but still understand how to work with, you know, vectors uh, and matrices. In calculus, you just need to have a high level understanding. So later on, when you study machine learning, uh, you don't get stuck on some basic stuff. Um, all right, so we covered SQL, Python, um, statistics. Now, when it comes to machine learning, I, I think this is the sexy part of, uh, of data science. Uh, so most people will, you know, build portfolio projects, and most of them are machine learning based, right? Um, when you study study machine learning, make sure that you understand uh, the workflow, the ML workflow. Uh, that's very important. Um, so knowing how to load data, right? Do exploratory data analysis. Uh, let's say loading data, right? Uh, run EDA, which means it includes, you know, summary statistics, uh, visualizing distributions, okay, um, correlation. So you name it, uh, a bunch of uh, data analysis stuff, but just trying to understand your data problems, right? This allows you to tell uh, missing values, right? And whenever you look at distribution, you want to tell are there any outliers, extreme values, right? Um, skewed, skewness in your distribution, because this will still need, for example, ChatGPT can help you sort of uh, make, create the plots, right? But you, you still need to interpret these plots to understand, okay, my data set has very skewed distribution, and this is how I'm going to approach this problem. I believe ChatGPT may be able to do this in the future, uh, maybe already, but uh, um, but yeah, I think as a data scientist, you will definitely need to uh, understand how to do EDA. Whenever you work on portfolio projects, don't skip EDA, explore to data analysis. If if someone look at your machine learning, whatever notebook, look at your code, right? do code review, and you skip visualization, you jump right into train test split and do modeling, uh, that means you're not very experienced data scientist. Um, you'll definitely need to spend a lot of time on data exploration. Um, and some people would recommend, you know, you have a separate notebook just for data exploration, and then you can have a notebook for, for machine learning. Um, that would do, um, but definitely don't skip EDA, okay? Um, and then you're going to start doing, uh, you know, feature uh, preparation, which includes, you know, pre-processing, um, feature engineering, right? Uh, feature selection, uh, so yeah, so, Preparing feature is very important. You want to show the effort in feature preparation. Uh, you don't want to just start like trying some machine learning algorithms right away. That make your job look so easy. Um, and uh, actually, like in real life, when you do machine learning, um, oh, it depends on the industry. But if you work for a bank, you actually need to spend a lot of time on EDA feature preparation. Um, but if you work in, you know, advertising industry or retail industry, where people care more about the performance of the model, uh, you may actually just focus more on the parameter tuning because prediction power is what you, you care about. So yeah, so uh, there will be differences there in terms of the process, but um, feature preparation is a very important skill a data scientist will need to have. So uh, whenever you build portfolio, don't skip this step. Uh, make sure you spend a lot of time on it. Uh, so the company can tell that you have experience. If everyone can just use Scikit-Learn to run some kind of model training, uh, you can't really tell who's better. Like, how do you tell that you have or prove that you have more experience? 
so the way you do data exploration, the way you prepare feature, uh, all of these are very important. Okay, so don't skip these. And uh, I, I know like it's very, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people want to focus on just the machine learning part, but machine learning is a pipeline and you have to follow the workflow. Okay. Um, and then of course we have um, the baseline model training. Right. So this is where we start to, you know, use different kinds of machine learning algorithms uh, to, to, uh, to create the models, right? Um, but training the baseline model, right? You don't have to use a very, spend a lot of time on uh, the model training yet and parameter tuning because you just want to tell if your model is making sense, right? Sometimes the performance is really bad and you may want to go back and fix the data problems, right? Um, but then you move on to, you know, the actual model training and tuning, okay? I'll skip some of those details. Uh, but yeah, make sure you follow the right workflow. Um, so how do you learn the best way to do, like, you know, what is the best workflow to follow, right? My recommendation would be, first of all, watch some YouTube videos, right? And help other people code. And then you can check out, you know, the Kaggle winning solution, uh, see how other people, well, it doesn't have to be the winning solution, but it could be a notebook that's uh, popular. A lot of people vote on that notebook. Um, and there's some best practices out there, right? Read other people's, you know, blog post and go to their GitHub and see how other people train models, what kind of workflow they follow, right? That's how you learn. Um, and data mining. Um, someone mentioned data mining. Um, data mining is, you know, a combination of predictive modeling, right? Machine learning and also data preparation, data wrangling, uh, you know, it used to be a very pop, it, it used to be popular, but now data science is pro probably like, you know, more popular, right? There's job titles in the past uh, called data miner, um, but it's basically data scientist, um, but they, they might be using like tools like Weka, uh, SAS, um, but yeah, and I think data scientist is a more sexy term. So let's just uh, stick with that, okay? Um, so in terms of scikit-learn and TensorFlow, these are just tools, right? So scikit-learn, of course, um, it's also spelled uh, uh, scikit-learn, right? TensorFlow or PyTorch. Uh, I would probably choose PyTorch over TensorFlow now. Uh, it's more popular. Um, but yeah, TensorFlow, PyTorch, just focus on one of them. Um, and Keras, which is part of TensorFlow now, okay? Um, but definitely start with scikit-learn. Uh, it's still one of the most popular. And then PyTorch is mainly for deep learning, but it can be used for other purposes as well. Um, okay. Uh, and in machine learning, then you need to have some sort of specialization, right? Okay, up to this point, most of the things we work with are like, you know, okay, you need to understand tools, but you need to also know algorithms, right? I think we missed this part. Um, what are some of the machine learning algorithms that you think we need to learn? Yes, regression. Okay, classification problems. Um, but yeah, re regression is like um, one of the machine learning problems, which is regression. You can have uh, classification. Um, there's there are things like dimension reduction. Um, and uh, under regression family, then there are all a bunch of algorithms, right? Linear regression, um, you know, decision trees. Um, I'm not gonna list all of these algorithms here, but definitely for classification learn, you know, boosting, right? Random forest, but they can be used for regression problems as well. Okay. So you need to, so I would consider these as classical. Uh, ML algorithms, which are still very popular, okay? Uh, in most of the companies, I think data scientists will work with these algorithms. It's not always going to be like neural networks, deep learning, because um, sometimes they actually don't beat the traditional algorithms in practice, okay? Um, but what deep learning really specializes in is uh, the specialization areas, such as natural language processing and computer vision, okay? Um, but I hope you don't get overwhelmed already because there's so many things you can learn. 
my recommendation would be focus more on the classical machine learning algorithms, learn a little bit about, you know, let's say a neural network, which can also be used to solve regression and classification problems, okay? So this is where you're gonna learn like, you know, uh, you know, PyTorch, right? Um, but when it comes to specialization, you start learning you know, NLP and computer vision after you become good at the traditional algorithms. Because uh, most of the machine learning problems you deal with in real life, uh, they're still structured problems, right? So um, especially those companies that hire a lot of data scientists, okay? Um, but if company want to hire someone who specializes in NLP, let's say they would like to build chat bar, they would like to build like a large language model tuning, uh, generative AI, trust me, they would not consider hiring a bootcamp graduate or someone who's like, you know, who only spent six months learning data science. You need to be extremely talented. Uh, when they hire specialists, they prefer someone who has research background, who has a PhD, who has at least a master in computer science with a specialization in NLP, right? Because they need to be very comfortable with reading uh, literature, doing research, and they stay up to date with the, the state of art uh, algorithms. Right? And they also are very good at coding. So I feel like if you want to go down that path, you probably need to go back and get you know, advanced degree. That will definitely help you. But it can be self-learned as well. I'm just saying that it's going to take you significantly longer time to get specialized in these areas. Uh, so if you're job-oriented, uh, focus on the classical machine learning algorithms first. Make sure you get really good at it. Build some portfolio projects, and you can start applying for jobs. Right? And at the meantime, I think it's all, always worth time to keep learning. Like You never stop like because uh, this field is evolving so fast, right? So after you become good at the, the classical machine learning algorithms um, and after you've created uh, the portfolio projects, you can come back and get more specialized and you can take a specialization course from Coursera, you know, uh, to learn NLP computer vision. Um, I, I think uh, as of now, maybe NLP is, uh, is more popular because of the large language models and generative AI. Um, but it's going to take some, quite some time to get specialized in, right? And even in NLP, I would uh, begin with the classical uh, or the traditional methods, right? Um, not every company, you know, are using the large language models yet. So the traditional methods, even just basic text processing will help a lot, right? Text pre-processing or text processing, um, okay? Cool. Um, yeah, and someone mentioned k -Nears neighbor as well. Um, but that's probably the easiest machine learning algorithm. Yeah. Um, and of course, unsupervised learning. Uh, so at least, at the very least, understand how k-means clustering work, right? So you can do customer segmentation. Uh, yeah, so these are some of the algorithms you need to learn. Um, I definitely skipped some of the details. You can expand on that, like boosting, then there's great indeed, you know, um, Grid and boosting, uh, there will be XGBoost. Um, in terms of packages, there are like light GBM, but there's also cat boost, uh, you name it. Um, okay. All right, so that's machine learning. Uh, and then we talked about statistics, Python for data science. Uh, we talked about SQL. Um, I'll remove R here. Okay. Now, uh, data wrangling is a very important skill to have. I'll put that under um, Python for data science. So you need to learn uh, Python programming first, but the goal is not to become a developer, right? The goal is to become, to, to, to use Python for data analysis. So you need to learn how to do data wrangling and, you know, the most famous data wrangling tool in the Python, Python ecosystem is, uh, is Pandas. Um, Pandas is not well known for handling big data. So it's good for toy data set, right? Um, but when you deal with large data set, typically, you know, you need to use SQL to pre-process the data, and then you can bring the data into a Pandas environment. Uh, but if you would like to scale that, um, you know, uh, for big data, then you have to consider um, using packages like Dask, 
or Ray.io or PySpark. Now, these are big data related stuff. Okay. Um, so that's data wrangling. Okay. Um, and there's someone mentioned data engineering. Um, I think that's a very good point. I think data scientists will need to understand data a little bit data engineering as well if you want to stay competitive in the job market. Because um, in some companies like you know startup, right, if they don't have a you know huge budget, they may expect the data scientists or the data engineers to to wear multiple hats. The data engineers can do data analytics as well, uh, or data scientists can do a little bit automation. Uh, so that means you need to understand how to work with, you know, for example, a cloud platform, cloud, so AWS or, you know, Azure or maybe GCP. Right? Just pick one of them. You don't have to be expert in all three because the skill sets are, uh, the knowledge is transferable. If you know AWS, it's not hard for you to pick up GCP, which is Google Cloud. Okay. Um, but you certainly don't need to become a cloud engineer, it's not necessary. Uh, data scientists or data engineers, they're still just leveraging the cloud platform, right? Or infrastructure to build data pipelines, to do data analysis. So if you're using Jupyter Notebook, you're probably just running that in the cloud, but your main work environment is still the Python notebook environment, right? Um, and uh, big data, uh, I think, uh, Data, data scientists will need to know big data for sure, uh, unless you work for a company that has very tiny data. Um, but if you work for a bank, right, um, and if you work for even healthcare, uh, usually you're dealing with big data. And if you work for digital marketing agencies, you know, advertising company, uh, and most likely you're going to be dealing with like billions of records, right? So it, it, it doesn't work in pandas anymore. So in that case, we'll need to learn how to work with tools like, you know, um, basically Apache Spark, right? And Ray is another option, um, but yeah, uh, Spark, um, understanding um, <clears throat> some other big data platforms such as, you know, uh, Redshift. Uh, these are data warehouse tools, right? Snowflake, um, but again, you're actually writing SQL. Um, data pipeline is related to automation. So, uh, so that means, uh, you know, um, job dependencies, right? Or you have ML pipelines. So a typical ML pipeline includes like data loading, right? Data pre-processing, model training. Uh, you can actually separate, you know, write these in separate scripts and you can, you can sort of automate this process using uh, a pipelining tool such as, you know, Apache Airflow which is something that data scientists would work with, okay? Uh, for scheduling purpose, right? Scheduler uh, and uh, understanding like cron job uh, can also be useful, but it's more uh, on the data engineering side. Uh, but I think it will be nice if the data scientists, you know, get some exposure to Airflow or similar tools, okay? Um, ETL stands for extract, uh, transform and load. That's more like uh, you know data engineering, um, but a lot of times data scientists are actually doing ETL as well. It's just like they don't do this in a production environment. They might be doing this just for their analytics purpose. So you're going to extract data from some sort of tables. You're going to do all kinds of transformation, data merging, aggregation. Um, so data scientists will do some ETL as well. Okay, but it's mainly for analytics purpose. And, uh, and sometimes they give the script back to the data engineer and get the data engineer's help to automate that. Um, NoSQL, I would say this is more data engineering. Um, data scientists, at best, they're going to basically read some data from NoSQL or um, after they create the model prediction, they would like to write that back to NoSQL. Um, but I don't think data scientists will need to be specialized in NoSQL technology, okay? So that's data engineering. Uh, to make it less confusing, I'm going to remove NoSQL um, and I keep the things that are that are relevant here. Okay, um, I'll remove ETL as well. 
Okay, so data scientists will definitely need to understand how to work with cloud, I think, know how to work with big data, and uh, understand a little bit more about automation will be helpful, okay? All right, uh, web scraping, uh, I would highly recommend web scraping as part of the, the portfolio project uh, that you work on because what you decide what the website you, you want to collect data from. So most likely it's going to, to be very unique, right? Um, and uh, when you, you know, tell the employer or hiring managers about this project, I think uh, it will be very interesting. Uh, so, you know, we have students who, who, who are into fashion. So they, they scrape data from fashion website uh, into gaming, sports. Uh, so there are all kinds of interesting stuff uh, that you can do, okay? Um, but web scraping requires, you know, working with uh, understanding the basics of HTML and CSS so you can parse those data, right? So that in Python, you're going to be working with, you know, Celine, uh, Beautiful Soup, which is a Python package to parse HTML DOM file and uh, Selenium and sometimes uh, Scrappy, uh, which is a web crawling package, uh, okay? And um, I would maybe move that under data engineering, okay? But it's related to, so um, when you do web scraping, it's a great opportunity for you to do visualization because whatever data you collect from the web, uh, you can visualize that and you can tell a very nice story about the website you're scraping. You can scrape jobs to do job market analysis. You can scrape, you know, um, uh, sports, right, website to do sports analytics. Uh, so it's always interesting if you can uh, click your own data, okay? All right, and then um, the business skills uh, are definitely important. These are some of these are soft skills, right? Communication skills, public speaking, um, presentation. So how do we even learn these skills? You know, you, you know, not everyone's you know graduate, a uh, graduate of business schools, right? Um, I, I think uh, my recommendation for presentation is that um, when you work on portfolio project, uh, you need to have some sort of project proposal. Okay, uh, proposal, and then you need to create create, a, uh, create some slides. Um, and this will be very helpful. Um, it's, it's actually the harder part because once you start to learn data science, you'll notice that training a model is actually super easy because over time you notice that there are some patterns to follow. It's actually more work to create the slides and write the project summary and project proposal, right? because you have to put whatever you, you've you done, okay? Uh, and you have to put that in, into words. And uh, a lot of people struggle with this. Right? It's just like when you're writing an F essay, um, and you notice that once you know it starts to flow, it becomes so much easier. But it's just like the first page, it's always the hardest to, to write, right? And, uh, and it turns out it's the same. Um, because writing a project summary or proposal sort of forces you right, to become less technical. You have to think about the audience, like who is reading the project summary? It could be a business person. It could be the hiring manager. Um, and it forces you, because we typically start from data processing, machine learning, visualization. All of these are just writing code, right? And now writing, putting that down, uh, you know, as a blog post, for example, or writing the proposals project summary, uh, you have to think about what you've done and you have to summarize that. But it's actually a, a process you absolutely have to do because it's just like job interview practice. Because when you go to an interview, the interviewer will ask you, okay, what did you do in this project? Why did, why did you choose this project? Right? What have you done in this project? And why did you choose this over that, right? Whatever algorithms. Um, and you, you go through this process a couple of times. Every time you work on a project, you write a project summary, you put that on GitHub, but it's not really just for you to show that to the hiring managers because most of the time they don't, they don't even get to see your GitHub project. But it allows you to go through this thought process and then 
you just get prepared for interviews. So doing an interview, you, you start to notice that you can actually talk about the project you've done because you even have a slide deck for that, right? Okay. Um, and visualization. Uh, visualization, um, so we use visualization in two different, right, in, in two places. First of all, EDA, and, but that, that is more analytics and it's more technical, right? So we use Python for that. So that's some sort of visualization as well. But if we would like to combine this with storytelling, right, visual storytelling, um, and, and maybe you can use Tableau or Power BI. If you don't want to pay for those licenses, then uh, maybe try some open source tools, okay? Um, so open source visualization uh, or dashboarding tools, okay? For example, Metabase. Um, and there's some other options, okay? So that's visualization. Um, and uh, even for data, so some people may think, okay, Power BI isn't it BI and data analytics. I think data scientists need to know Tableau as well, right? Um, and you can use a Tableau dashboard to visualize and explain your machine learning model, right? So there are two different places where you can showcase your visualization skills. One is EDA um, and then the, the model visualization, okay? Um, public speaking, um, I, I think uh, we we don't get a lot of opportunities to do public speaking, but it will be great if you can, uh, for example, present your presentation slides, um, you know, present your project to to your friends, or if you have like you know uh, a mentor, I think it will be great if you can present that to the mentor. Uh, that's part of the the mock interview process, right? Um, Business is also very important. Uh, I think you need to understand a lot of the machine learning and data science use cases. For example, how is data scientist, oh, sorry, data science applied in retail, right? In insurance, uh, in, in retail banking, in telecom. So I think you need to read a lot. Um, but you already have a lot on your plate now as a someone who wants to become a data scientist. So, um, I recommend doing this kind of research um, before you go for an interview. If the hiring manager or the hiring company is an insurance company, then just do your research. You know, it takes you two to three days to get familiar with that industry. When you work on the portfolio projects, you can also choose to focus on a, uh, a specific industry vertical. And uh, yeah, you can, for example, two projects are related to insurance and one project related to you know, telecom, um, it's, it's up to you, but I think um, I always recommend um, learners to choose a portfolio project based on like the industry. So choose an industry first uh, and then find a, find a good data set to work on, okay? Oh, I, I think I come, uh, covered everything. Um, do you have any questions, any comments? I have to figure out a way to share these notes with everyone. Um, but yeah. Oh yeah, thanks for uh, for reminding me. Um, let's say uh, someone mentioned Git. So, well, let me put that under portfolio project building. So uh, let's say after we build the project, right? Uh, portfolio project uh, first, choose a topic, and then find a good data set, right? And then you work on your, you know, your implementation. Uh, but after you've done your project, uh, you would like to sort of showcase your project. Um, so this is where GitHub and Git, right, uh, becomes, you know, useful. That's or GitHub pages. That's a place to sort of um, to, to, to showcase your project. Um, but some people will do blog posts as well, right? So you can leverage Medium, Substack. Uh, these are some good platforms and WordPress, but it's kind of old fashioned. Um, okay. And build 
a, an actual ML or data science app. Right? So where you can actually host on on AWS, you know, host it on uh, AWS, for example. Okay, some software uh, tool to recommend you can do Streamlit. Uh, that's a Python library that allows you to build um, data science, you know, tools or applications. Um, so I think bash is also a good suggestion. So when you work with cloud and big data, uh, then you definitely need to understand like Linux commands, uh, a little bit bash programming, uh, but you just need to understand the basics, right? How to SSH. Um, but these are not hard. Um, you can follow some tutorial and, uh, you can learn all of these individually, but I would recommend just learn this as part of the project. Um, you know, otherwise it would become too technical. I, this is still for data science and for data engineering, I would highly recommend students start from Linux, learn everything. But if your goal is to focus on data science, um, and this is just part of the, the tools you're going to use to build a portfolio project. Okay. All right. I think we, uh, we, we went through everything and, uh, um again um i think uh we covered more than what's in here uh if you're interested uh just go through the career guide um and i'll share the link with you again okay now i think i have some time for q a uh so if you have any questions uh feel free to ask me and uh let me share these links with everyone again in case you just joined and what is the best way for me to share this note with everyone? Because um, I know share, um, if I use share, that means um, I need to add each individual. Like I need to have your email. Is there a way for me to publish this page? I'll, I'll, I'll try to figure that out. And then uh, I will share this on Discord, okay? Uh, I think pasting it here is, let me try, but it's going to be... Uh, let me see if that works. Oh, it, it worked. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. All right. Any questions? Oh, I missed some some of the questions. Um, what uh, what platform do you recommend to have internships, apprenticeships uh, to build data science portfolio? Um, I'm not aware of many internship and apprenticeship. Um, there might be. So I guess you have to Google like, uh, uh, you know, online internship or apprenticeship uh, for data science. Uh, I'm pretty sure you'll find something. Uh, with WeCloud Data, we offer uh, data science bootcamp, and then students in our bootcamp will have access to something we call real client project. Uh, so it's it's not internship uh, because internship is usually very junior level, you know, analytics work. Um, but you know, we we give students the opportunity to work as a consultant uh, to solve data challenges for real clients. Um, so those will be more hardcore implementation and the student get trained and learn a lot on those projects and they get to interact with the, the clients as well. Um, yeah, so that's part of the services we, we offer. Um, but for attend apprenticeship internship, you can definitely uh, um, Google and hopefully can find some uh, opportunities. And there might be some freelance opportunity. By the way, if you would like to get, for example, get paid, uh, for this type of internship or freelance work, uh, you absolutely need to have a portfolio, right? For example, if you um, sign up on, uh, you know, Upwork, um, it's the biggest challenge is to get your first client. So it would be great if you can have a blog post, right? You need to start thinking about building your personal brand. Uh, so you have portfolio projects, uh, you have, um, you sort of document, you know, your, 
your um, uh, your learning journey or you know but basically just write some blog posts and articles uh, and then when you reach out to potential clients you can show them the projects you have worked on um, but uh, hopefully that can that can help you get started yeah Uh, is it possible to get an internship and learn on the job? Yeah, absolutely. But I have to tell you right now, it's very hard to get internship because, um, you know, why would a company pay you to learn on the job? Um, so there are a lot of internship programs in university. If you're a student, then definitely like you have co-op and internship programs. Um, what I heard is that this year, um, you know, some of the, the most famous like co-op programs, like a lot of students cannot get co-ops. Uh, because I think because of the hiring freezes and uncertainty. Um, yeah. Uh, is an online master's degree in data science, if it's from a reputable university worth doing, uh, will it be helpful for me to get a data scientist job? Uh, it might be worth doing if you're after the credential Will it help you get a job? I don't think so. Um, if you are job oriented, I think boot camps nowadays are probably better options compared to the online masters. Uh, this is how I think about it. I might be biased because you know I work for uh, you know a training academy and boot camp, um, but boot camps are very much focused on building projects, um, and uh, the tuition fee is actually going to be. Uh, quite a bit lower than the master's degree. So in the master's degree, you spend a year to two, right? Um, and uh, the tuition will be higher. Uh, you do a lot of coursework, but there will be more theory. Uh, and some of those assignments give you a lot of pressure, but it doesn't also, it also doesn't help you. It helps you build a stronger foundation maybe, um, but it just doesn't help you with the jobs. Um, and because uh, there are so many people graduating from a master's program, they're still, not getting a job so getting a job there are different like you know different aspects of it right it's not just the skills and credential most companies will give you a take-home assignment they'd rather know that you can actually do a project instead of just getting a you know a degree um so yeah but if you have the time and you you, you can do a master's program it's always going to give you an advantage right uh, advanced degree is always helpful but if you're just getting st like starting to think about it, then there are a lot of factors, you know, the, the cost and also um, how much time it's going to take and how much of those time you're actually focusing on building the skills that can help you get a job, you know, including building portfolio projects and things like that, and also career service and career support. Yeah. But in general, like when we talk to hiring managers, uh, I would say that they would always prefer someone who has a master's degree, right? So it's still useful, um, but you have to decide that for yourself, whether it makes sense. So for some people, they have time constraints. They would like to get a job in six months. I don't think a master's is gonna help you. But if you have two years, like you plan out this, uh, you know, uh, you have a full-time, a stable job. You would like to do a part-time master's degree. I think it might be worth it to, to pursue that because you're not in a rush to, to get a data science job that will actually work better. Uh, or if you really have, you know, are interested in getting a master's degree, advanced degree, right? That's gonna work out, you know, uh, for your entire career, then it, it's worth it to, to just go full-time, to join a full-time master's program, uh, that will help you as well. But the tuition cost might be higher, and then you'll be, you know, out of job for quite a while. Um, so if you can afford that, that's great. Um, and boot camps are for people who, have a, an immediate needs, like I want to get a job faster. And then I think bootcamp might actually work out better. But it is also not a, the best fit for everyone. So it really depends. Talk to a bunch of people and see which one works for better for you. How many of these tools need to be mastered for data analytics? Um, if you are interested in getting a data analytics job, uh, it's going to be a little bit different, right? You need to understand SQL really, really well. Um, so since we're on this topic, we can talk about um, data analytics and uh, maybe BI learning path. I think you know, need to know SQL, um, Python for data analytics, right? So you need to understand Python as well, which includes 
things like um, basic programming, uh, pandas, right? So data wrangling, uh, that's important as well. Uh, but I think for data analytics, you need to focus more on the visualization and or let's say visual storytelling. Um, and that means you need to know Tableau, Power BI. Uh, they have like uh, free trials. Definitely learn one of these or ideally both of them. Because um, companies using Tableau will less be less likely to use Power BI. They just choose one of these. Um, both are very, very popular right now. Um, and then if you want to work in data analytics, you need to know a lot of business use cases. Um, so for example, um, maybe you need to understand a little bit about, oh, sorry, um, marketing analytics, right? Sales analytics, right? Risk analytics. So you need to understand a bunch of business use cases and how data analytics can be used for market analytics, sales analytics, right? Um, so the use cases are very important. Supply chain analytics, okay. The tools are just tools. Like you can, you can learn SQL, Python, you know, from anywhere, but to become a data analyst, um, you need to understand a lot of use cases and uh, your portfolio project need to be built on that. But you don't need to worry too much about data engineering and, uh, and machine learning engineering. Um, do you know about industry future potential? Uh, see, like healthcare, clean tech, finance. Um, I, I think uh, data analytics, first of all, you don't have to limit yourself to only one industry. The data analytics skills are very much transferable. So you can, you know, spend three years in healthcare, and then it's very easy for you to switch to finance as well. Uh, by finance, I mean retail banking, for example. So you can work in uh in in the banks as a data analyst um you can work in clean tech um I, I, yeah retail it doesn't matter i, I think uh, as long as you have the skill set uh and you understand this because the business uh stuff can always be learned on the job uh I, I don't find people coming from a retail background like i don't think they'll have a hard time getting into the banks uh working as a data analyst in the banks like they don't require you to have a cfa you don't have, need to have any accounting background Right. It's more on the analytics side. So I, you don't have to, like, I guess just go with whatever opportunities that come your way and gain the experience first so that your second job will be way easier. Um, Rana said, I'm a business analytic master's student and will graduate soon with an undergraduate in electronics engineering. I keep applying for jobs related to data science, but I keep getting rejected. When do you think the job market will be better? And what would be your suggestions to do? Yeah, uh, this happens a lot recently. Um, <clears throat> it's just, uh, I think overall, uh, there are a lot of hiring freezes. Um, and uh, I think in the, in the last few months, it's easier for someone who has senior experiences to get jobs. Companies are still hiring, but a lot of the jobs are senior opportunities. Uh, so for junior roles, uh, I would say you just have to be patient. But at the meantime, it's what you can do that's more important. So what you can do is just keep applying. You never know, right? Keep applying for more jobs. And at the same time, you need to, um, you need to, because you, you graduate from a business analytics program. Uh, so I would recommend you learn, invest more time in you know data science, learning big data, um, just upskill yourself, learn more, uh, work on more projects. And when, you know, when the market get better, you just want to have that a little bit extra competitive advantage compared to other job, you know, job seekers. Um, Python certification can help for, no, I don't think Python certification can help you get a job. Um, it's not that, you know, it's not that relevant. Like companies care more, like it, having a certification doesn't mean you can pass the interview test. So most of the company will give you a technical assessment. They'll give you some Python questions and SQL questions. As long as you can pass that, they sort of, they are confident 
or they're comfortable with your skills, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I don't think you need to spend time on certification. Um, if you do have the extra time, I'd, I'd rather spend that on like on lead code or, you know, it's still going to help you become a better programmer, I would say, like learning more about algorithms and data structures, because at least it prepares you for some of the, the high tech, big tech jobs, you know, Facebook, Amazon, right? Do companies value online certifications? Um, taking some courses will definitely be helpful, but my experience, like working with so many different students in the past, is that even having a master's degree nowadays don't give you a big advantage. And people will tell you that they have a master's degree and they're still, like it's not as easy as before, like to have like a lot of interviews. Because uh, companies starting to realize that, well, it's important to hire someone who can come in and just do the work. So how do, how, how do you prove that someone can get the work done? And they have to sort of look for proof. And unfortunately, online certification, it's it's abundant. Like there's so many people with certification. There's so many certification courses. And uh, I think companies care more about what you have done, right? The projects. So showing people a certification, a certificate is not that useful anymore. Not because it's not useful. Like it's just like everyone has some sort of certificate on their resume already. And then if 99 out of the 100 candidates have certificates, has a master's degree, now how do we tell who's better, who can actually do the work? So employers are always looking for something extra, right? And it turns out that if you, because it's chicken and egg problem. If you haven't worked as a data scientist, then the best way to prove that you have the experience is some sort of internship. If you don't have internship, that's fine. But at least you have to prove that you have worked on some pretty complex end-to-end -end projects, data science projects. You have to impress people with the work you've done. All right. So, um, so that's why portfolio project is still useful. Um, but everyone nowadays know that they need to build a portfolio and that becomes problematic again. Um, it's, you know, when we are talking about this tonight, like we think that, oh, job market is tough. It's hard to get a job. You know what, when you talk to hiring managers, I talk to a lot of them, they think that finding the right candidate is also challenging. Um, yeah, because the cost of sifting through all of those portfolios and resumes to find the right person is also very high. They, you know, sometimes they end up interviewing 10 people and, uh, Five of them are actually not qualified at all after you talk to them. And then two of them are superstars who are not even interested in working with your company and they might be passive. I don't know. And then there are a few good ones. They may actually end up getting multiple offers. Then you spend one month, two months, and you're still not hiring the right person, right? Um, so it's a two-sided problems and companies hiring are also having challenges it's not it's not like they it's so easy for them to get get the perfect candidate uh, these courses should should we learn them in parallel or one by one what should be the basic threshold then we can try learning projects yeah i i think um, you can start um, learning sql first and python this is basically the sequence, I would say, um, but you can move data engineering to the end. It's not the most important thing for data scientists, um, but yeah, this is probably the right sequence. Um, but as soon as you've learned SQL and Python, I think you should start working on data analytics project already. It doesn't have to be a machine learning project, right? And then as you add machine learning skills and knowledge, you can start to work uh, you know, on machine learning projects. But yeah, uh, in, in our data science bootcamp, like when you finish like SQL, uh, we already ask students to work on SQL related projects. So you work on SQL projects, you do visualization using Tableau, and then you move on to Python for data science. And the students will work on web scraping project and then with some visualization project as well. And then when you move on to machine learning, uh, you work on two to three portfolio projects, right? And the students will learn big data. So there will be one big data project as well. Um, and every project you work on, you need to do some sort of presentation, have project proposal and summary as well. 
Uh, that's sort of how we structure everything. I would highly recommend this to you, um, you know, anyone who's doing self-learning as well. Um, do you have any other questions? Thank you for so many great questions tonight. Um, I, I like the interactivity. Uh, you guys contributed a lot of great ideas and together we created a pretty good and decent uh, you know, learning path. Uh, and so hopefully you have something that you can follow, which is structure and uh, and start, you know, there are a ton of great resources on uh, on, on YouTube as well. Um, and again, like I would like to plug the We Cloud Open. Uh, so we have right now uh, free SQL and Python courses. Uh, let me show you. And then uh, I think this year we're planning to add data science and we're open source on machine learning as well. Uh, so you just stay tuned, okay? Um, you go to learn.wecloud.data.com and you can sign up yourself. Um, it does require an email and you have to sort of uh, verify that it's your email, and then you come to WeCloud Open. Uh, if you would like to follow a self-paced course, right now we have SQL and Python, um, and we also have a bunch of workshops, right? Workshops in uh, data science, and for example, if you're interested in data engineering, I think we have some topics on Spark, uh, Data Warehouse, AWS. There's some career talks as well. Um, but yeah, we'll keep adding uh, new content to we cloud open and hopefully that that that's helpful um but i would highly recommend you go through our sql and python course um i think they're pretty decent and uh so we have slides right um recordings and these are not live classes actually our instructor produced the course um, but at the end you'll find a lot of exercises uh, if you go to python um yeah there are a ton of exercises you can go through um and hopefully uh, in the future when this is more, um, you know, complete, um, we can issue some sort of, you know, certificate as well. So you guys can print on your own. No problem. Thanks, guys. Um, there's another question. Uh, does completing a data science bootcamp help in getting a data analyst or data scientist job? This is a very good question. Um, I have to be honest, not every student in a data science bootcamp will end up getting a data scientist job. Um, so typically we see that about 50% of the students or maybe 45% of the data science bootcamp graduates, they get a data scientist job. Like the job title is data scientist. And uh, about 30 to 35% of the students will get a, any kind of data analytics jobs. Like that includes like a risk data analytics, data analysts, right? Data analysts work in, in marketing analytics, right? Um, and, and then about, we did some analysis in the past, I think about 18%, but that was a while back. Like that was maybe 2019. 18% uh, of the students will get data engineering jobs. Uh, that's maybe because our data science bootcamp focus a lot on big data and Amazon Web Services. Um, but yeah, students, but all of them get data jobs. Um, but it's not guaranteed that you'll get a data scientist job. Um, yeah, and sometimes it depends on your like uh, education, uh, your past work experience. And there are many factors, but you'll definitely get a data analytics job for the very least, I think. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this session and find it useful. Um, the recording will be uploaded to YouTube this week. And, uh, and tomorrow evening, we have a, an introduction to Python session as well. Um, we have a bunch of events next week as well. So stay tuned. And uh, I hope you guys have a great evening. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you guys soon.